narrate something, I don't think about it, which sounds really weird because you'd imagine that people like J.K. Rowling would sit down and then they'd have an idea, but for me, it just sort of hits me when it does, and if it does, then I'll write something. Hello, and welcome to the E! News Podcast. I'm Andy Cohen, your host. This year, 12 BFS students received 17 prizes in the New York City Scholastic Art and Writing Awards. Hundreds of thousands of 7th through 12th graders participate in the competition annually, and about 2,500 achieve national prize recognition. This year, we had honorable mentions, silver keys, and three of the ultimate prize, the gold keys. The gold keys went to 11th grader Amanda Becker, 9th grader Betsy Allen, and 7th grader Clara Shapiro. Now Clara, who's in the 7th grade, won three prizes, an honorable mention, a silver key, and a gold key for a short story that was competing with 7th through 12th graders. So today, Paul Romano will speak with Clara about her writing and hear a little from her story. Hello, Clara. Hello. I'm here with Clara Shapiro, who is a gold key recipient for her short story. How many? Clara, tell me a little bit about your story. It is manifested in the form of an old lady who um, we can see going back in time to when she was younger and she lived in Korea, but at the core it's really about um, superstition and self-fulfilling prophecy. How were you inspired to write this story? So every year I visit my grandparents who immigrated from Korea and they always tell me a lot of stories about my great grandma and other relatives. So I hear about them a lot and I was inspired by hearing about my great grandma to write this because she died and then I was thinking, how could I really say goodbye to her? So I decided that this was the best way. Very nice, Clara. Can you tell me, has your experience at BFS influenced you as a writer at all? Mm -hmm. Well, if I had been bullied, which I have to say I haven't been bullied, then I think I would have uh, a little bit harder time writing about a struggle because this is about you know being beaten down and thinking well I'm not good enough so I don't have a personal experience but I think that being at a very supportive community in Brooklyn Friends has helped me view bullying and cruelty from an outsider's view and so while the story is not about bullying it is about sadness so I think that even though I haven't really had to experience that much sadness having being at Brooklyn Friends because if I'm at such a warm community then it's kind of good that I haven't had to experience that so it didn't really affect me. Speaking of the warmth of the community, has any teacher inspired you as a writer? Well Miss Erin tells us a lot of stories sometimes and Loris was actually the first person I showed Halmi to and she kind of inspired me because she gave me approval of Halmi. She said it was good. So because the dean told me it was good, I was thinking, yeah, this must be good if it's the dean told me I'm good. So yeah, she inspired me. Who are your literary influences? Oh, well, obviously Harry Potter, who isn't. But uh, I also was influenced by the author of Echo and Esperanza Rising. I think her name is Pam Munoz Ryan. She's really cool. And uh, I also like the book Heidi by Joanna Speary, I think. That's interesting. Yeah. How long did the story take you to write? Oh, well, I don't have the exact time frame, but it was definitely sometime last year, probably about a month or so. When did you know you had a good story on your hands? Before you wrote it? During the process? Uh, I don't really remember what I was thinking when I sat down and wrote it. I didn't just sit down and think, well, now I'm going to write a story. I mean, it was just that I had heard about how many, so it was just sort of, at first I was writing about it in my journal, and then I actually started writing it for real, and then I started to realize towards the end, because when I get too close to writing, I think, I start thinking that it's really bad, because I'm just way too close to it. Then I step away a little bit, 
and then somebody else will read it and they will say that it's good. So after my parents read it, I started to feel more confident. Would you like to read this story? How do you want to do this? Why don't you give it a try? Okay. Mm. So the title is Harmony by Clara Shapiro. I will only suffer three days longer, Harmony croaked softly in Korean to her second daughter, Hyunja. The only English words Harmony knew were scrawled in tiny dog-eared notebooks she had kept since her arrival in America 25 years earlier, but most of the phrases were mundane, such as, how much is this rice? Expressing feelings Expressing about dying was not dying something not the textbooks had covered. covered. Gazing up at the ceiling, as if she thought heaven would now take her if she asked, Halmany wished for her suffering to be over. Eyes were the only part of Halmany's face that weren't wrinkled, but they reflected change, time, and worry accumulated over 93 years. With some effort, Halmany rolled over to cradle the face of her daughter. Hyunja gazed down, not wanting her mother to see the tears forming in her eyes. She chided herself. Hyunja had known the end was coming for a while now, and she knew resisting the cycle of life was fruitless. Halmany had dozed off, leaving her features slightly more relaxed, not contorted by the pain of her old age. Hyunja's father, long dead, had often commented on the beauty Halmany had once possessed. Halmany had been sought after as a young woman, her pristine skin glowing like moonlight, her hair in ebony silk, and her eyes warm and inviting. Hyunja had no reason to doubt her mother's death prognostication. In Halmany's village back in Korea, Halmany had been known to make accurate predictions. Thank you, Loris. That was terrific. Um, Loris Wong is our fifth and sixth grade dean, and she is also a science teacher in the middle school. Uh, and she's here today to talk to us a little bit about Clara's writing. Um, but specifically, as with Clara, why is it important to inspire or simply acknowledge student work? So I think sometimes students don't trust that their own work is good, even when it is really good. You know, we teach students to have a growth mindset and to always be improving, and I think sometimes students look at their work and they're very critical of their work. They want to be better and better and better, and so it's important to step back and tell them that they're doing great. And as a child, I know that I was very critical of my own work. And when somebody said something positive to me, I was like surprised. And I was like, oh, like maybe I am doing OK. And that helped keep me moving forward. Nice. Clara alluded to learning about other people's perspective from the anti-bullying curriculum at BFS. And a large part of the curriculum comes from the Everybody's an Ally program that you and Jesse Phillips Fine developed and implemented some time ago. Uh, and has become an important pillar uh, of the middle, middle school advisory program. Can you tell our listeners briefly uh, about it? Um, of course. So I started off as an advisor in fifth grade, and I felt you know, I wanted to have discussions with my class about uh, stereotypes and bullying and uh, diversity-related topics, and we only could talk about those topics during lunchtime groups that were optional. Actually, what was funny is I presented at an all-school faculty meeting what I've been doing with my lunchtime groups, and someone from the faculty was like, hey, that sounds like a pretty good program you got there. Wouldn't it be great if everyone in the middle school you know, had those conversations? And that got me thinking, like, hey, maybe I could write a curriculum about this. And so um, I had gone to a professional development workshop, and I'd seen a movie called Let's Get Real, and um, I thought it was a really good movie and a good starting off point and so Jesse and I applied for a summer curriculum grant to write an anti-bullying curriculum for the entire middle school. The idea behind it is you know Brooklyn Friends is a really supportive community people are really positive so we didn't want to have a bullying program in our school be a very like punitive it's like oh if you say this mean thing then you get a detention or if you call someone this slur then you get a suspension or whatever so it's um the curriculum is designed to cultivate like the natural kind instincts that are in students and develop empathy and to create a community of allies so if you know one person is being targeted, the rest of the community will stand up like a big safety net for the person. That's terrific. Thank you so much for being with us today, Loris. And now just a little more of the interview with Clara from Paul Romano. In Halmany's village back in Korea, Halmany had been known to make accurate predictions. And that's the beginning. That was very beautiful, Clara. Are you working on any other short stories? Currently, at the moment, um, I was thinking about how uh, 
free press is being challenged in America. So I was thinking about what would happen if everybody who believed in free press and in democracy sort of came together and um, all around the world and stuff and sort of went against uh, this supposed King um, Trelawney, who is, as you can guess, a combination of Trump and Melania. Um, but that's not a very developed story yet. <laughs> well, good luck on that. Well, thanks. We'll see how it goes. Thank you. Uh, can I keep this? Sure. Thank you. It's a beautiful story. Thanks. And thank you, Clara, Paul, and Loris, for helping us out with our show today. And let's all remember to let your life speak. <laughs>